On April 15, 1997, a father and his two sons discovered a body in a secluded, dry stream bed close to the Morgan County line off Eagle Rock Road in Union Grove, Alabama. The skull, hands, and feet of the deceased individual had been removed on purpose, probably to hide his identity. Investigators suspect the man's heart and spleen may have contained evidence because they were also removed. According to forensic analysis, sharp edge trauma was the cause of death. The gruesome efforts by the victim's killer or killers appeared to work because for years, investigators were unable to identify the victim. However, in 2019, Alabama authorities partnered with a DNA technology company named Parabon Nanolabs, which gradually made progress in the investigation by first enhancing and clarifying the DNA samples from the body and then comparing those profiles with others in genetic databases. Scientists from this company were able to create a genetic profile of the victim after overcoming DNA deterioration and bacterial contamination that had occurred over the course of the previous 26 years. They used DNA phenotyping to determine the physical characteristics of the victim. They later produced a composite sketch of the victim's profile which revealed a male whose age was between 20 and 28 years old. He was of North European descent, with a light or pale skin. He had blue eyes, brownish blonde hair, and few freckles. The investigators at the time released these sketches to the public in the hopes to get information. But no lead came out of it. In order to identify the victim, scientists at Parabon Nanolabs entered the body's DNA profile into public genealogical databases. Although they were able to pinpoint a few distant relatives of the body's DNA from the databases at their disposal, it took months to finally identify the victim. After finding further relatives and matching that information with historical records, the scientists were able to name the victim as 20 years old Jeffrey Douglas Kimsey of Santa Barbara. In 2023, investigators were able to track down a member of the Kimsey family in Tennessee, who then directed them to Kimsey's parents in Santa Barbara, California, where the identity was verified. Jeffrey Douglas's parents claimed they didn't know he was dead. He was never reported missing either. It isn't clear what he was doing in Alabama at the time of his murder, but investigators believed he was probably just passing by. Since Jeffrey Douglas Kimsey's case was ruled as a homicide, detectives are still on the case, trying to find his killer. They, however, announced having persons of interest in the case and are actively pursuing every lead and utilizing evidence gathered at the scene where the body was discovered. Hopefully Jeffrey Douglas Kimsey gets justice soon. On a cold morning on November 15, 2015, around 11.30 a.m., Hale and his wife, who lived on Farley Lane in Lillian, Alabama, discovered a startling sight on their private driveway. They noticed a strange car that had been there the first time they came out around 7.30 a.m. On seeing the car again, they had a bad feeling about it and decided to check it out. When they peered into the car's windows, they saw the body of a young man who appeared to have been shot to death at the back of the seat. Hale immediately dialed 911, and the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office arrived at the scene and identified the individual as 22 years old Devin Deshun Kennedy from Pensacola, Florida. His mother, Tammy Sims, had reported him missing a day before. Further investigations revealed that Devin had a history of run-ins with law enforcement in relation to drug charges. When Tammy Sims got the news of her son's murder, she was devastated. In an interview, she described Devin Kennedy as a determined young man who sought a better life for himself and his family. He was also a devoted father and a loving son. According to Sims, her son always wanted to run his own business. He always mentioned starting a restaurant and investing in real estate. Sadly, Devin's dream was cut short and his life taken away from his two-years-old daughter. Devin was working and attending college the day he was killed. His mother knew something was wrong when he didn't come home or answer his phone calls. Tammy Sims sought justice for her son for many years, pleading with the public to put themselves in her shoes and say something if they knew anything. Sadly, the case was opened, but gradually became cold. Police also investigated the case at the time, and identified a few people of interest, but they did not have any solid evidence to link them directly and charge them with the crime. For eight years, Devin Deshawn Kennedy's case file stayed cold on the Baldwin County Sheriff's shelves. In April 2023, 
the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office announced the arrest of 32 years old Deputy Darnell Herring, who has been charged with the murder of Devin Deshan Kennedy. According to the police, they earlier received information that eventually led to the arrest of Deputy Herring. They, however, never mentioned what information it was. According to detectives, Devin and Herring may have known one another, and the motive for murder was robbery. Herring had shot Devin elsewhere and left him off at Lillian, Alabama. Dakota Herring's first court appearance took place Friday afternoon on the 21st of April, 2023. He informed the judge that he had been imprisoned for the past seven years in Florida due to a felony firearms charge. He had just served the remainder of that prison sentence when Baldwin County detectives named him as their top suspect in Devin Kennedy's murder case. After his bond hearing that Friday, Judge Bill Scully set the bond amount at $150,000. Dakota Herring would be required to wear a GPS ankle monitor and be prohibited from leaving the state as part of the terms of his release if he were to successfully post bond. One day, as Jessica Lynn Keene waited for the bus, she was attacked by a ruthless and sadistic predator. Her body would only be found 48 hours later, about 20 miles from her home. The crime scene portrays the unimaginable horror she experienced in her final moments. All the odds were against her as she struggled for her life in the dark, while her killer was on her trail. Her brutal murder would go unsolved for almost 20 years, but determined detectives were able to catch her killer by chance using DNA. Today's case takes us to Columbus, Ohio. Columbus is a busy city with plenty of entertainment options. There are numerous eateries, shops, bars, concert venues, art galleries, and other establishments in the short North Arts District. The Gallery Hop, which takes place on the first Saturday of every month, is a fantastic way to see what Columbus has to offer in terms of artistic talent. The North Market, a public market with vendors selling a variety of local cuisine, fresh produce, gifts, and more, is also located in the short North neighborhood. Columbus is home to a large number of parks and museums, including the Scioto Mile Riverfront Park, the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium, the Columbus Museum of Art, and the Center of Science and Industry. The entire year is filled with special occasions and festivals. But in the fall, football is the region's way of life. The Ohio State Buckies are the city's pride and joy. Though the city might seem all safe, fun and bubbling now, it wasn't always like that in the 1990s. In fact, the homicide rate and violent attacks were high in the year 1991. Jessica Lynn Keene was born on September 24, 1975, to Rebecca and James Keene. She was well-loved by her parents and basically had everything a child could ever ask for. The love, care, and the peace of mind at home reflected in her academics while growing up. Teachers simply called her a good student. In the year 1991, 15 years old Jessica Lynn Keene was a honor roll student in Westland High School. She was gifted, ambitious, and loved by her family. Jessica became a popular cheerleader and a talented performer. She was well known and well liked by friends. According to her mother, Rebecca, Jessica had a lot of dreams and goals. Jessica, idealistically, would have loved to have been a singer an actress. I guess, realistically, Jessica loved animals and wanted to go to college to be a zoologist, Rebecca said. However, Jessica's smooth life and the beautiful relationship she shared with her parents came crashing down in March 1991, and this had to do with the teenager's love life. Jessica had fallen in love with an 18-year-old school dropout, Sean Thompson. They started dating, and their relationship was new and exciting. But, according to Jessica's mother, the love affair began to distract Jessica from her academic life. Also, in an effort to spend more time with the person she was infatuated with, Jessica even quit cheerleading and would often skip school to see Sean. This made her grades decline drastically. Just like every parent who wants the best for their child, Jessica's parents became worried and forbade her from seeing Sean Thompson ever again at least until her grades came up enough for her to get a scholarship into college. Jessica was in love and wouldn't listen to her parents. 
she continued to sneak out of the house to see Sean. When she began to threaten her mother about moving out of the house, she knew she had to put her daughter back on track before it gets too late. At a point, Jessica and her mother's arguments got worse. They both realized they needed some time to let off some steam. They then agreed that Jessica should spend two weeks at the Huckleberry House live-in counseling facility for troubled teenagers. While there, she was to attend therapy sessions in an effort to get her back on the right track. Jessica complied as required, and on March 15, 1991, her live-in stay at the facility was almost over when things started to go very wrong. She called Sean Thompson the day before she was scheduled to return home, but it seemed she probably didn't get the response she was hoping for. According to those who witnessed the phone call, Jessica and Sean got into an argument over the phone. At a point they broke up and, on ending the call, Jessica was said to have been very visibly upset. Afterwards, Jessica, who was devastated by the situation, told her friends she was going to the mall and then made her way to the bus stop close to Huckleberry House to wait for the next bus. Nobody would ever again see the 15 years old alive after that. It was getting dark and Jessica failed to return to the Huckleberry House facility. Her friends and the staff at the facility waited for her, but when she didn't show up, they reached out to her parents to inform them what had transpired. She was eventually reported missing to the police and a massive search for her ensued. However, the search came to an end 48 hours later when her body was sadly discovered at the Foster Chapel Cemetery, about 20 miles from the Huckleberry House. Jessica had duct tape wrapped around her hands and mouth and was otherwise naked, save for a bra and one sock. The teenager had been brutally beaten and raped before being fatally struck in the head by a gravestone that was discovered nearby. Strangely, Jessica still had her wristwatch and ring on her. But her beloved necklace, inscripted with the word taken, which was a gift from her boyfriend, was gone. After starting their investigation, the police concluded that Jessica had likely been sexually assaulted between two and four hours before she passed away, due to the cement at the crime scene. After a thorough inspection of all the hints and clues at the cemetery, the investigator in charge of the case, Special Agent Greg Costas, came to the heartbreaking conclusion that Jessica Lynn Keene had been abducted and held captive in a car, but she had only just tried to elude her captor. She then ran across a country road in fear for her life and entered a cemetery where, based on a knee print in the ground and a misplaced sock, she may have attempted to conceal herself behind a gravestone. Unfortunately, when she thought her attacker had lost track of her, she fled her hiding spot and crashed into a fence post in the dead of night as she attempted to flee and reach a nearby farmhouse. Since the farmhouse was lit up, she intended to run towards it, believing someone was there to save her from the monster running after her. Sadly, she couldn't make it there on time as her great fall alerted her attacker, who later discovered her and killed her with a 70 pounds gravestone. This discovery devastated her family, friends, and the police. They couldn't fathom the horror she must have experienced as she tried so hard to stay alive. According to Special Agent Costas, he was adamantly determined to use all of his resources to identify the killer of the promising teenager and solve the murder. I've never been so passionate about anything that I've ever worked on in my life. The thought of this young girl, 15 years old, who had such a bright future, being murdered in such a horrible, horrible fashion, you cannot help but want to do everything humanly possible to find out who did this. Agent Costas said, Rebecca Keane was clearly mortified by the terrible crime and haunted by the extreme fear her daughter must have experienced while attempting to find safety in the pitch black cemetery. Everything I tried to prevent, her life from being ruined happened anyway. A devastated Rebecca told the media. As the investigation progresses, sheriffs in Madison County focused on Sean Thompson, Jessica's boyfriend, but they discovered that he wasn't in Columbus when Jessica was murdered. Sean and a few of his friends had left for Florida. However, they were eventually sent back to Ohio. The police collected Sean's DNA and interrogated him and his friends in great detail, but 
it was quickly determined that he and his friends were not a party to the incident. This was because the DNA from the semen sample at the crime scene did not match Sean's or even his friends. They were, however, exonerated of all charges. Though for the investigators a whole week had passed and the search for the actual murderer or murderers had become fruitless. Even so, Jessica's mother's nightmares about her passing never stopped. What they did to her, the fear that Jessica felt she would do anything to get away. And I can feel her heartbeat running through the cemetery. I can feel the deep breathing she was probably doing when she knelt behind the tombstone. I can hear her praying and I realized that that was the worst thing that I believe anyone could go through, Rebecca said. The investigation became unproductive gradually. Investigators, however, were unable to forget the grisly murder that had occurred on their doorstep and they continued to periodically review the evidence in the hope that new information might come forward someday. At last, it actually did in 2008. After rerunning the semen sample from the crime scene through the system, Madison County Sheriff Jim Sabin and Special Agent Greg Costas found the hit on CODIS that they were looking for. It belonged to Marvin Lee Smith Jr., who was quickly apprehended and sent to Ohio to face allegations of impermissible sexual conduct. Marvin Lee Smith was on bail when he met Jessica Lynn Keene in 1991, having served nine years in prison for assaulting two women in Columbus. Marvin Smith was required to submit his DNA as a formality when he was released from jail, after serving time yet again in 2000. Unfortunately, it was never noted as being related to the Keene case, and it wasn't until Sheriff Sabine and Special Agent Costas had a lucky break that a match to Jessica's killer could be established. Marvin Lee Smith confirmed in court in 2009 that he had abducted Jessica after seeing her by chance at the bus stop on that March day in 1991. This confirmed the police's initial suspicions. To the surprise of the jury, he described how he had indeed pursued Jessica through the dark cemetery before eventually getting a hold of her and killing her with a gravestone, using such force that the stone had to split into two. As part of a plea agreement, Smith admitted guilt to first-degree murder while avoiding the death penalty. He will be held at the Lebanon Correctional Institution in Warren County, Ohio, until at least March 2038 after receiving a sentence of 30 years to life in prison. However, those who reside in Columbus and elsewhere will undoubtedly be hoping that this dangerous person stays exactly where he is for life after the revelation of the nightmare murder that he committed. This case takes us to Heflin, Alabama. In 2002, Heflin was a small town which has a population of less than 3,500 people and a total area of just 16.31 square miles. Back then, everyone pretty much knew everyone. And when a triple homicide occurred in a place like Heflin, it shook the very core of the community and left behind aftershocks that may still be felt today, particularly when the victims were a young pregnant woman and her six-year-old son. Monica Pritchett Rollins was a 23-year-old mother of two boys named Dalton and Aaron who were six years old and two years old respectively. Before her murder, Monica was also expecting the birth of her third son in a few weeks. After she and Jeremy Rollins, Dalton and Aaron's father and her high school lover, made the decision to separate and file for divorce, Monica and the boys moved into their Sugar Hill Road home in late 2001. On Friday, September 13, 2002, Donald Pritchett, Monica's father, had been looking forward to Monica and the boy's arrival at his Aniston house, so he could finally give Dalton his gift, a colt Dalton had named Mojave. When they finally arrived, they spent the evening talking, eating, and riding horses before Monica and the boys returned to their Heflin house at around 8.30 p.m. with the intention of returning later that weekend. But after the weekend had passed with no further communication from Monica, a family member made the decision to go see if everything was well with her and the kids. Nothing could have prepared them for what they discovered when they arrived at Monica's mobile home around 10.45 a.m. on September 16, 2002. Monica and her first son, Dalton, had been cruelly killed in their own house. 
According to autopsy results, they died as a result of multiple stab wounds they sustained somewhere over the weekend. Because of the assault, Monica went into labor. Her unborn child was later discovered dead and only partially delivered. Aaron, her two-year-old son, was discovered hidden in a closet, inside the house alive and unhurt. Around 6 p.m. on the same day, Jeremy Rollins left Southwire after completing a 12-hour shift. He found out about the killings of his ex-wife and his oldest son a few hours later when the police requested him to report to the station. As the investigation progressed, officials claimed that Jeremy was not a potential suspect and that he cooperated with the inquiry the entire time. The detectives did all they could to find the culprit at the time, but there were no tangible leads. At the time of the murder, DNA, fingerprints, and other types of evidence had been gathered at the crime scene and transferred to the Alabama Department of Forensic Science for examination. Unfortunately, due to budgetary restrictions, the forensic department experienced severe backlog problems at the time of the killings, which caused a delay in processing. The case, however, went cold for decades until January 2021 when investigators reopened the case. They re-interviewed 60 people and resubmitted a cigarette butt found at the crime scene to the forensic lab for DNA testing. After a thorough analysis, investigators linked the evidence at the crime scene to Lewis Landon Spivey. Spivey, who is now 36 years old, was 18 when he allegedly killed Monica and Dalton. He was romantically involved with Monica. After the murders, in 2010, Lewis Spivey was imprisoned in Florida for 15 years due to a separate robbery and severe assault case from Bay County. Investigators visited him in prison for an interview. On June 26, 2023, Lewis Landon Spivey confessed to the killings of Monica Rollins and Dalton Rollins. He allegedly offered officials a complete confession by describing the incident and accepting sole responsibility for the killings. Finally, after 21 years, Lewis Spivey was taken into custody by Health and Police Department after his release from a Florida prison. The young son of a woman named Yvonne Johnson was playing behind their Brookhaven Trailer Park house on Hearst Street in Opelika, Alabama on the afternoon of January 28, 2012, when he discovered a small human skull. Startled, the little boy ran inside to inform his mother, who then dialed 911. In a short period of time, Authorities reached the location and retrieved the skull. They then spread out into the woods and discovered more human remains. Also, a pink long-sleeved shirt with heart buttons and ruffles was found. This was discovered next to a brook, but it was unclear to the investigators whether it was associated with the human remains. Following forensic examination, it was discovered that the bones belonged to an African-American girl between the ages of four and seven. In line with malnutrition, the results also showed that the young girl's bones were underdeveloped. She had an obvious abnormality to her left eye, which was presumably brought on by abuse, and there were indications that she had been physically assaulted before her death. The young girl suffered fractures to her ribs, shoulders, limbs, legs, and skull. She suffered more than 15 separate fractures from blunt force trauma in total. All these injuries had been incurred before she passed away. The girl's DNA was run through the missing person database, but no matches were found. The police soon appealed to the public for information. Unfortunately, there were very few tips, and after just four months, the case was closed. The unnamed youngster was later referred to as Opalika Jane Doe, or Juvenile Jane Doe. In an effort to get some urgently needed information, federal agents at the FBI office in Quantico, Virginia, used forensic imaging equipment to create a sketch of what the young girl may have looked like while still alive. The composite sketch was made public by the detectives. They had billboards up around the southeast and circulated the flyers widely online, urging anyone who may identify the young child to get in touch immediately. Investigators soon determined that Opalika Jane Doe had died between 2010 and 2012, However, after a former vacation Bible school instructor at the Greater Peace Church in Opelika came across the sketch, she gave investigators a picture from 2011. She thought that Opelika Jane Doe was in the photos. They made public the church photos, which showed the young child with a defect in her left eye. She had black hair that was fashioned in little, tight curls and was medium in length. The general population was prompted to reflect on the past, 
and to examine whether they knew a little girl who attended the Bible school. According to them, Opalika Jane Doe usually appeared to have been slightly unkempt and wearing filthy clothes. She was described by the teacher as being quiet, solitary, and not particularly social with the other kids at the Bible school. Authorities tried to find her name in churches and schools, but they found nothing. They soon transferred Opalika Jane Doe's remains to the University of South Florida's Forensic Anthropology for Isotope Analyses after the images were made public. She was identified as being from the southeastern region of the country, most likely Alabama or nearby states. With no lead, the case went cold for 10 years. In 2022, detectives expanded their search for answers outside Alabama. They went to other states where the girl might have lived before her murder. They questioned residents and interviewed quite a number of people, showing them Opalika Jane Doe's possible photos to see if they could identify her. Luckily, there was a significant breakthrough in the investigation when authorities discovered 50-year-old Lamar Vickerstaff Jr. to be Opalika Jane Doe's father. Lamar Vickerstaff was born and raised in Opelika, but throughout his time in the Navy, he resided in a number of locations. He finally settled at Naval Station Mayport in Jacksonville. When investigators met with him at the Naval installation to break the news of his daughter's death, he steadfastly refused to identify his daughter. His wife, Ruth Vickerstaff, was questioned by investigators, and she admitted she had no idea who his daughter was or who she might have been. She and Vickerstaff had tied the knot in 2006. The detectives did further investigation and discovered Opalika Jane Doe's real mother, who was 37-year-old Sherry Wiggins. Sherry disclosed to the police that in January 2006, she had given birth to a girl who went by the name of Amori Jovia Wiggins. However, after her visitation privileges were revoked, her ex-husband Vickerstaff and his wife were granted physical and legal custody of her daughter in 2009. Sherry Wiggins was able to provide investigators evidence that she had been paying Vickerstaff child support since 2009. According to investigators who looked through pediatric and school records in the communities where the Vickerstaffs resided, Amori Wiggins was never enrolled in school and was never reported missing. In January 2023, DNA testing made it clear that Opalika Jane Doe was actually Amori Jova Wiggins. On January 17th, Vickerstaff Lamar and his wife Ruth were both taken into custody. Ruth was charged with failing to report a missing child, while Vickerstaff was charged with felony murder and failure to report a missing child. Finally, after 11 years, Amore Wiggins' identity was finally buried with her. On February 27th, 2023, hundreds of residents of Opelika and investigators came to honor her life. Detective Alfred White of the Opelika Police Department remarked, We can finally put the right name and right face to her, and we don't have to call her Jane Doe anymore. Sherry, Amori's mother, was also present. In her words, she heartbreakingly said to her late daughter, I didn't want you to have it hard, so I let your tiny hand go, thinking you'd be playing in a big backyard. Before 1998, violence was uncommon in the small town of Laurel, Montana. When a woman got raped, stabbed, and had her throat slit in September of that year, residents were left shocked and wondered who could have done it. Two months later, 18-year-old Miranda Fenner was killed in a similar manner. Now, after two decades, the perpetrator has been caught and brought to book. Miranda Fenner, a young woman with her entire life ahead of her, was only attempting to complete a shift at work when everything was abruptly taken from her. Sherry and Mike Fenner welcomed their daughter, Miranda Fenner, into this world on December 26, 1979. Miranda and her younger brother, Tim, were raised in Sacramento, California, before the family made the choice to relocate to Laurel, Montana in the year 1990. They wanted to get away from such a big city and also be closer to family. Miranda Fenner had deep dimples in her cheeks, dark hair and eyes. Her large heart and compassionate nature are remembered by her friends and family. She loved animals and had a desire to work with kids one day. Her mother, who always supported the underdog, had misgivings about some of Miranda's friends but was aware of Miranda's sincere desire to uplift those around her. Additionally, she was never afraid to express her opinions, and one of her teachers called her feisty. A few months prior to the time she was murdered, 
Miranda was involved in a car accident that resulted in a broken neck. This made her constantly wear a brace neck and was unable to leave the house until she fully recovered. Due to this, after her healing, Miranda was excited to take up a job at the movie store, a locally owned video rental store in Laurel, which is now closed. Given that her grandparents ran the Lohoff Motel across the street, her parents felt comfortable allowing her to work there. The movie store was only three blocks from her home, so she had no need to be concerned for her safety, though she frequently closed the movie store by herself. This was a typical scenario for young people working in retail at the time, and on many occasions. The worst that can happen is that a customer wanders in at closing hour. On the 15th of November 1998 appeared to have been a normal day for Miranda Fenner. Her shift came, and she made her way to the movie store. Though that evening her shift became anything but normal, Miranda called her mother and then her uncle. Both calls appeared to be normal. However, the night changed drastically for the worse around 8 p.m. Two fishermen saw a crawling Miranda in front of the movie store's door at 8 20 p.m. bleeding and obviously hurt. They immediately stopped to assist her. After they dialed 911, police showed up shortly after. Just about that same time, Miranda's brother Tim, who rode his bike to the movie store to rent a video game, saw the police lights flashing. He stopped and turned around to call Mike, their father, who then came to the store as well. Officers informed Mike what had happened and told him that Miranda was being transported by life flight helicopter to St. Vincent's Hospital in Billings, which was about 15 miles away. Sherry immediately left work after learning from her mother that Miranda had been rushed to the hospital. While Miranda Fenner's life was being frantically saved by doctors, Sherry and Mike made their way to the clinic and waited eagerly to learn about their daughter's condition. Unfortunately, as Miranda underwent surgery to treat her injuries, she passed away. It was at that point that Sherry and Mike discovered that their daughter had been murdered. Even though Miranda Fenner's murder scene was gruesome, there wasn't much evidence left behind. Miranda had suffered multiple head stab wounds as well as a slashed throat. There was no weapon left behind at the crime scene and there were no leads found in the fibers and hairs that may have been left behind by her attacker at the scene. Police were unable to identify a suspect or the motive. Although it was noted that a small amount of cash had been taken from the video store's cash register, robbery could not be completely ruled out as a possibility. Investigators questioned over 700 witnesses for two decades. They pursued a handful of leads, including a number of false confession, but it was in vain. Miranda Fenner's parents never gave up hope that the killer or killers of their daughter will be apprehended. The case, however, went cold for almost two decades. In 2012, Miranda's case was transferred to Billings Metro Police's Cold Case Unit, which continued to look into the case. In the year 2016, the Yellow County Police got another confession from Zachary O'Neill, a minor offender from the area. He was admitting to the 1998 killings of both the raped woman and... Miranda Fenner. The police had previously dealt with numerous false confessions, and the man's account did not make sense. Though she was still alive, the man claimed to have killed the rape victim. Additionally, the information he provided about Miranda's murder was a well-known public knowledge. Also, Zachary O'Neill happened to have confessed from a psychiatric hospital in Washington. The police brushed off his confession, but a determined Zachary returned to the Yellowstone County Jail in March 2017. At the time, he was intoxicated, but he admitted to the crimes once more, providing more details. The police took his DNA before releasing him, because an arrest in Montana cannot be made based solely on a confession, they had to verify his account. Zachary O'Neill's confession was, however, true. His DNA matched the evidence in the raped woman's case. He had left her for dead after slitting her throat. He was confessing to her murder because he was unaware that she had lived. And on the day of Miranda's murder, Zachary had been present in the video store twice. Members of his family claimed that the second time, he arrived only moments before Miranda was attacked. 
At the time, Zachary, who was 18 years old, had been questioned by the police, but denied being involved in Miranda Fenner's murder. During the investigation in 2019, Zachary O'Eal claimed that he used to steal back then in 1998 to support his drug habit. He said he was on meth the day he killed Miranda Fenner. According to him, the first time he went to the store was to rent movies. A few days later, Miranda rang him up for the movies he had rented. When his mother, with whom he was living at the time, saw one of the films, she ordered him to return it because it was pornographic. He, however, went back to the store not just to return the movie, but to also rob it. Zachary waited for all customers in the store to depart before he struck. According to him, he stabbed Miranda out of fear that she would recognize him after the robbery. He ignored the murder for years, but eventually his conscience caught up with him. After his own brother was murdered in 2013, it was a relief when his killers were apprehended. He therefore desired for Miranda's family to experience the same closure. In August 2019, Zachary O'Neill went on trial for both Miranda's murder and the attempted murder rape of the other woman. He pleaded guilty and was given two life sentences. In 1999, 17-years-old J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hollett were best friends. They were incoming seniors at Northview High School in Dothan, Alabama. The girls who lived in Dothan, Alabama, had decided to travel to Headland for J.B.'s birthday celebration on the 31st of July, 1999. They loaded up in J.B.'s 1993 black Mazda at around 10 p.m. and headed out. However, they soon got lost in Ozark, which is roughly 20 miles from their house. At around 10.30 p.m., the girls halted at a gas station to ask for directions because they couldn't decide where to go. They also used the gas station's payphone and appeared to have a better understanding of where they needed to go after speaking to some friends. However, an hour later, they were still in the dark and far from where the birthday celebration was to take place. They made another stop, this time at a different store that had a payphone. Tracy then called her mother, Carol Roberts, and explained that they were lost. She soon added that they were returning home. Sadly, Carol never saw her daughter or her best friend ever again. The next morning at about 5 a.m., Carol noticed her daughter hadn't returned home. She knew something was wrong because Tracy was never late. When it was 8 o'clock and Tracy had not yet returned, Carol called the Dothan Police Department to report her missing. Authorities got to work and discovered JB's car that day. It had been parked on Herring Avenue in Ozark, with the tank empty, despite it being filled the previous day. The car's driver's side window was rolled down a few inches, and the doors were unlocked. A handprint on top of the trunk gave investigators an eerie clue as to what might have happened. The police opened the trunk and discovered JB and Tracy in it. They both had been killed by a gun. Although dressed, both teenagers were strangely dirty. Semen was discovered on the scene, which allowed detectives to obtain a DNA sample from the offender. Because both girls still had their purses and valuables, authorities were able to rule out robbery as a possible motive. The only item missing from the car was JB's keychain, which held the car keys. It was unclear to investigators if JB and Tracy were killed in the trunk or somewhere else. On September 1st, 1999, a month after the girls were discovered, a man named Johnny William Barentine walked into the Ozark Police Department to give his testimony of what he thought might have happened to the girls. According to him on the 31st of July, 1999, he had gone to the grocery store to purchase milk for his two-year-old son, just about the same time Tracy contacted her mother from the big little store. On his way back home, his car got hit by a black truck with Dothan license plates close to Herring Avenue. He claimed to have seen the truck speed away from the crime scene where the girls were discovered. The investigators interviewed Johnny for four hours, and during those times he changed his testimony at least five times. Johnny at a point placed himself at the crime scene. After much inconsistencies in his testimony, the police eventually filed two murder charges against him. Johnny was sentenced to death. However, he kept on asserting his innocence and said he had just made up the stories to get the reward money. In the year 2000, the grand jury decided not to indict Johnny. Upon discovering that his DNA did not match the semen sample discovered at the crime scene, he was no longer treated as a suspect. 
Over the years, a number of additional leads turned out to be false, but the detectives never gave up looking for a DNA match. The authorities have looked into a lot of suspects throughout the years. They conducted hundreds of interviews and collected DNA samples from quite a number of people, but there was no luck. On the 20th anniversary of the girls, investigators reopened the case and decided to use a new approach. They entered the evidence at the crime scene to a public genealogy database in March 2019 and soon got a connection. Officials soon announced the arrest of 45 years old Coley Lewis McCraney. McCraney, who had been in Dothan all along, was charged with five counts of capital murder and one count of first-degree rape. The community and Marlos Walker, the current chief of the Ozark Police Department, were astonished by how the investigation turned out. Chief Walker actually attended school with McCraney. They found it hard to believe that he could be accountable for such a heinous deed. Back in 1999, McCraney would have been 25 years old, divorced from his first wife, and was involved in an ongoing paternity lawsuit. Ironically, the day before the killings, the judge had actually mandated that he submit a DNA test. Records show that he never followed the directive. McCraney had never been arrested before, and he was never considered a suspect during the initial investigation in 1999. He got remarried in 2001, and at the time of his arrest, he was a bishop, motivational speaker, and working for the Lord. After his trial in April 2023, Coley McCraney, who is now 49 years old, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole.